let's dive right in. So, last week, we covered maybe two verses, I think. It was, it was crazy. This part of the Bible is so deep, so complex, that we have to take it very slowly. Have you guys ever noticed that if you read something too quickly, you will often miss understand what's being said like if your eyes go over it too fast you'll think it says one thing when it actually says something else that's the reason why we are going through this chapter very slowly because there's a lot of characters go ahead and bring the beat down for me just a little bit there's a lot of characters that we got introduced to in this section in this chapter of the bible um we have a dragon who's that that's satan we have a beast. Who's that? Wait, what? Uh-oh, that's a problem. See, who's the beast? No, man, it's not. It's the Roman papacy. That's the beast. Okay. So, I'm glad, I'm glad somebody is paying attention. We are diving in. <laughs> I'm just messing around. All right, here we go. We are in Romans, Revelation chapter 13. Mm, man, we're picking it up at verse eight. Let's go. The Bible says, and some that dwell upon the earth. It doesn't say that you guys got to see that. That's very important. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Who are they going to worship? The beast. Okay. They shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, we have a whole lot of concepts and things happening in this one verse. We could have spent the entire service breaking down this thing here. The fact that it says all that dwell upon the earth, that's every single one of us. Guess what? That's not every single one of us. I'm going to show you that part. It says, shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb. When was the lamb slain? From the foundation of the earth. Okay, so let's start from the beginning because it says all that dwell upon the earth. Now, give me Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. This is the ultimate goal of Satan. This is all he really comes to do. He's going to deceive. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth, how many? Which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So right here, the Bible is telling you he deceives how many? Man, the whole world. Guess what? It's the whole world minus one group of people. Okay, let me show you. Give me Matthew chapter 24, verse 24. Matthew 24, 24 is going to start letting you in on a secret. There's a group of people that the Bible says they're not going to be deceived. Now take a look. It says, for there shall arise false Christ. What's that? That's an antichrist, isn't it? Okay, so there shall arise rise false Christ and false prophets and shall shew great signs and wonders. In so much that if it were possible, is it possible? It's not possible, but if it was possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Can the elect be deceived? It is not possible for the elect to be deceived. Okay, well, um, watch this. Give me Isaiah chapter 45, verse 4, because did you know that you can't choose to be one of the elect? <laughs> That's the whole thing. Elect means somebody chose you. You don't get to choose to be an elect. Somebody chose you. It's it's not fair, but that's the way that it is. Watch this. I, Isaiah chapter 45 verse 4 says, For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, who's Israel? Mine elect. Who are the elect? Clearly, I did not make that up. That's what the Bible says. Israel is his elect. It says, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Okay, so let's just track back through these precepts real quick. Uh, the dragon deceives who? The whole world. You know what? Everybody got to point to themselves and be like, I am deceived. 
If the scripture says he deceives the whole world, then that means that you're deceived. At some point in all of our lives, we have been deceived. We may be being deceived now, or we are going to be deceived. That's not such a terrible thing. That just means you believe some stuff that you can't prove. <laughs> That's all it means. Now, when you find some deception in your life, you've got to cut it out. If you let it grow, then the seed of the serpent is growing in your life. See, but once you cut that out, more truth begins to grow in your life. Okay, so it says he deceives the whole world. And then Jesus said, if it was possible, he would deceive the very elect. So that lets us know that it's not possible to deceive the elect. And then we read here and it told us who the elect is. Who's the elect? Israel is the elect. Okay, so some of us, it is impossible to deceive. You know why? The Most High has selected us that we would not be deceived. It was him that elected us to say, hey, you're going to see a whole bunch of lies, but you're going to have eyes to see right through them. Give me Romans chapter 11, verse 4. We're going to find out now how it is that he selected, because it's not even all Israel. It's some of Israel whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Romans chapter 11, verse 4, the Bible says, but what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Who's Baal? Baal is Satan. What are they bowing their knee to? The image. They're bowing their knee to the image. Okay, he says, I have 7,000 men that have not bowed their knee to the image. Okay, we read a scripture in Revelation that says he's going to cause everybody to worship. All right? Okay, give me the next verse, verse 5. He says, even so at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. That means there is a group of people that I have chosen, I have elected them, I have given them grace so that they will not be deceived. Jump in this same chapter to verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it? Because it's telling you, Israel is mine elect. Okay, but he said he has 7,000 men. Isn't that weird? Because 7,000 men isn't all of Israel, is it? So all of Israel has not obtained what they were looking for, but the election hath obtained it. And what happened to the rest of everybody else? They were blinded. So even you're going to even come in contact with some Israel and they're going to be like, yeah, I, I'm going to go ahead and get it. I'm going to get the snake bite. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and get the jab. I'm going to go ahead and fall for the mark of the beast, whatever that may be. We're going to find out. We're not getting all the way down to the mark tonight. So in our next week's service, when we finish 13, you will clearly see all of the things that comprise what the mark of the beast is. It's not just one thing, neither is it located in just one place, right? Where's it go? In my head or in my hand? Okay, so it's, it's multiple things. Over the years, people have been surmising about what this thing has been, and they came up with all kinds of ideas, and they were all wrong, you know why? Because all of them excluded what everybody else said. But if you took all of them and said, yeah, it's that, and it's that too, and it's that too, and it's that too, then you would figure out what it was. All right, so here we go. Give me verse 8, same chapter. Let's find out a little bit more about the election. It says, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear. For how long? unto this day so even within israel okay now we know we read that israel is god's elect we also know that israel is god's chosen but that doesn't mean all israel that means he has selected a specific group within israel that will not be deceived does that make sense all right take me back i want to see something else about that revelation scripture so now we know it says and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Okay, there's a comma right there. And you're like, everybody? Well, almost everybody. Okay. Whose names are not written in the book of life. 
You guys heard about this book of life before, right? So watch this. I'm not going to ask you what is the book of life. I'm going to ask you who is the book of life. The book of life is also the tree of life. Did you know that? Because what is a book made of? What is this material? This is a tree right here. This ain't nothing but wood. This is a tree. So when you're taking from the tree of life, you're also reading from the book of life. Now, it's one thing that you get the word out of the book of life. It's a whole other thing to have your name written in there. That's what you're striving for. Man, I hope my name is written in there. Okay, let's cover that book of life section real quick. Give me Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. It says, and at that time shall Michael stand up. Now, we've read the scripture quite a few times, but this is the funny thing about precepts. When you get to a certain selection of scripture, you're like, man, I thought that was this. And it turns out it's related to this because it could be related to 50 different scriptures. That's what makes it a precept. Because watch here, look, it says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble. What's that called? The great tribulation, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, what happens? Thy people shall be delivered. Everybody? Nah. Everyone that shall be found written in the book wow it talked about the book of life who's the book of life again jesus is okay so when you're reading daniel chapter 12 and you get to that line all of a sudden a light bulb should go off in your head and you're like man he was talking about jesus i need to go back and read this whole book because daniel's whole book was talking about jesus as a matter of fact every word that every prophet ever spoke was all talking about jesus how's that possible what does it say on there? The testimony of Jesus is what? Spirit of prophecy. So if you want to learn more about Jesus than the average person knows, see, there's like, there's us that believe in the whole volume of the book. And then there's those that only believe in the 27 books, just the New Testament. They don't know that much about Jesus because they haven't read that much about Jesus. But if you're like, man, I really want to know more about Jesus, well, you're going to have to get into Daniel and Nahum and Obadiah and all of the prophets because every word that they spoke was pointing to Jesus. All right, let's take a look at the very first mention of this book. Give me Exodus chapter 32, verse 32. Because you guys have to remember, when Moses went up, he saw into heaven. 32, 32. Exodus chapter 32, verse 32. He saw how the tabernacle was shaped. He saw the lampstand. He saw all of those things. Guess what else he saw? He saw Jesus. He saw the book. So this selection right here that we're about to read is not going to be so strange when you realize that God was revealing to Moses his prophecies. Okay. Now, the children of Israel are getting on God's nerves. They're getting on Moses' nerves. And this is what Moses says. It says, yet now, if thou will forgive their sin. See that emoji right there? See that emoji? That's an emoji in there. Yeah. We like literally had to look that up and figure out what is that? That's an emoji. What is it? It's a hammer. That's what Simon says. It's a hammer. Yeah, you sit. it's a hammer pointing up. And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Let me see, what do we got? Genesis, and then comes Exodus. In the second book of the Bible, Moses, who was also a prophet, already knew that God had a book written and that he would blot people's names out of it. Now, let's see what God's answer is, because he's like, man, Lord, I want you to forgive all of my people. And if you're not willing to forgive them, then just blot me out of the book. What does that mean? Can you be blotting out? Can, can your name be blotted out of the book if it's not already written in there? It has to be written in there first, right? And he's like, erase that. I was tripping. I don't know. Okay, so watch this. Give me verse 33. Let's see what God says. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Whosoever what? Sins. What is a sin? A transgression of the law. Oh, okay, so now we can clearly say that God is saying, whoever breaks my law gets blotted out of the book. All right. Huh. Give me Deuteronomy 29, verse 20. So when Moses was seeing all of these things in heaven, he saw the book. As a matter of fact, the book itself is talked about all over the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 20. The one. It says, the Lord will not spare him, but then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man. And all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. So when you commit sins, God says, man, you blew your chance. You blew your chance. Your name was written in there. I'm just going to... now." To erase, that means to rub out, right? What is blot? What do you do when you blot something? You dab it. You dab it, right? You're dabbing it, okay? It's interesting because he's putting the blood over it. Yeah, he's dabbing it with blood. We're not going to get super deep into that right now, but you need to see that picture. Um, no, we're not. Okay. Uh, give me Psalms chapter 69, verse 28. Psalms 69, verse 28. Hopefully you guys are writing down these precepts because these are things that you're going to need to be able to go home and teach your family. Everybody, even children, talk about the book of life. You need to know that the book of life is Jesus. And what does that mean? You have to be in him. Does that make sense? You got to be in him and he has to be in you. Okay. Psalm 69, verse 28, the Bible says, Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Okay, so if you're not written with the righteous, who are you written with? The wicked. We don't even refer to them as unrighteous. They're just wicked. Give me uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. Revelation chapter 3. Verse 5. I, I'm just pulling a couple of precepts because I want you to see that from the beginning to the middle to the end, the book has always been there. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. The Bible says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. I want you to see this part like a courtroom. The father is the judge and Jesus is your attorney. He's a master of the law and he knows all the laws that you've broken. Okay. But he's got a long list of clients that he is planning to represent in court. And you better hope that your name is on his list of clients that he's going to represent because it's going to be very easy. You're going to walk to the front of the court. The father's going to be sitting there and he's going to say, how do you plead? Just like they do in court. And how are you going to plead? He knows everything you've ever done. You're going to say guilty out of your own mouth. You are going to admit that you are guilty. And then Jesus is going to slide up. He's going to say, um, I got Daniel on my list right here. He's written in my book. He's, he's covered by my blood. Oh, okay. You're forgiven then. Some people are going to slide up and they're going to be like, yeah, I'm here. Can't wait to go to the kingdom. And they're, and, and they're reading off the name and Jesus is like, Flipping through the pages, and he's like, um, is there, there's no other book. I'm the only book. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't have your name written here. And then they start an argument with Jesus, and they say, Lord, Lord, remember when we was prophesying in your name? We did many wonderful works in your name. We cast out devils, and Jesus like, I, I really don't know this. Can we get security? Jesus replies, I don't know you. That's the same courtroom scene. So your name needs to be written in that book. Hallelujah. Give me Revelation chapter 20. Now let's take a look at verse 12. Now this is what most people don't understand. First shall be last, the last shall be first. 
in the resurrection, when we rise in the first resurrection, that is not a resurrection of judgment. We don't get judged at that time. When you rise in the first resurrection, when you come up and you look over, you just start smacking hands. Boom, I'm in. If you rise in the first resurrection, you're good. That's when you're saved because you can't die anymore. Does that make sense? If you rise in the first resurrection, you don't go back into the grave. You're good. Think about it for a second now. When is the judgment? Does judgment happen at the first resurrection or the second one? Ah, the second one. See, so if you're good, you get a pass. You rise in the first resurrection. That's not the time of the judgment. It's the second resurrection where we have the great white throne judgment. Let's take a look. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, it says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. Okay, so I want you to see, these are the books that you're being judged out of. It's not a mystery. He's not going to pull out some crazy book that you've never seen before. He's not, Liz, you're not going to get to the gates and he's going to be like, give me a Quran. <laughs> That's not going to happen, right? He's not going to be like, give me a phone book. I need to see. He's not going to judge you out of some book that you've never seen before. That would make him unrighteous. But when it says the books were open, these are books. There are 66 books in this one book. That's what gets opened up. And all he's going to do is compare what you did with what the Bible said. Okay, but watch this. And another book was opened. What book is that? Let's keep reading. Which is the book of life. So Jesus is opening up now, right? And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their faith. They tell you just have faith. How come they're not getting judged according to their faith? Does it say according to the grace that God gave them? It says according to their works. What are your works? That's what you do. That's what you do. You're getting judged according to what you did. Okay, so the dead, they wake up and that book that they've been running from for their whole life is opened in front of them. Man, and they probably look at it and they're like, oh man, oh, I hate that book. You hate it more now than you did when you were alive. Because when you realize that it's that book and he's judging according to that book. And if you have not kept his commandments, if you have not confessed that Jesus is the son of God, if your name is not written in him, then he will not represent you in court. Give me one more verse right there. Verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Were any of these people alive? No, they were all dead. Okay, now watch this. And they were judged, every man, according to their what? Their works. The Bible is not lying. That is not a misprint. Faith without works is what? Just like these people that are getting judged. Give me verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. What is this? This is the second death. We just saw a judgment. Okay? Now... Give me the very next verse, verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Man, you don't want to rise in that second resurrection. Yeah, you want to make sure that when that trumpet sounds, you come up out of the grave, right? The first time. All right. Give me Revelation chapter. Uh, how many chapters are in Revelation? What you say? What you say? Anybody? How many chapters are in Revelation? Do you know why there's 22? Because in the Hebrew alphabet, there's exactly 22 letters. That's why. Because what is he? He's the word. How are you going to make word without letters? Okay, so watch this. Give me Revelation chapter 22. I'm taking you all the way to the end of the story. Verse 19. Revelation chapter 22. Verse 19, we saw it from the very beginning. Now we're looking at it at the very end. It's still the same thing. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. Wait a minute. You think the commandments are done away with? You took that part out? You broke even the least commandment and you taught men too? Yeah, you called the least in the kingdom of heaven. You know why? 
because your part has been removed from the book. Your name got blotted out, right? You had every opportunity, every single Sunday, Wednesday, Saturday, you had every opportunity to be convinced one way or the other. But the problem is most people, they're not convinced. They're iffy. They're like, "Eh, you know, I keep some commandments. (laughs) Some of them I do. I'm not convinced that I have to keep all of them. You know what I'm saying? I have a pork chop later on today, but I'm going to pray over it and it's going to be blessed. You, you, you you, You think that your prayer can change the molecular structure of the pork chop and make it clean? That's not possible. Hmm. Okay. It says, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Take me back to uh, Revelation. So now we've covered, we're thoroughly covering that verse. And all, we see now that it's all except for the elect that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb. So it's the Lamb's book of life. Isn't that right? Slain from the foundation of the world. Now, that, that's curious right there. Um, who's the Lamb? Jesus is the Lamb. Let's just prove that real quick before I get into this other part. Because if I don't prove that, if you're like, oh, well, you know, I'm not really sure who it is, then you won't understand what it means that the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Give me John chapter 1, verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. That doesn't look like John chapter 1, verse 29. That's why I'd be flipping through my own pages back here. Okay, watch this. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. What does the Lamb of God do? Which taketh away the sin of the world. Does that make sense? Okay, so we have proven that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And what does he do? He takes away the sin of the world. When did he start taking away the sin of the world? It's about to blow your mind. When? When he came? When he died on the cross? When did he start? Huh? Where? He he started in the garden. He started in the garden. So watch this. Oh, man. Give me Exodus chapter 3, verse 21. Now, we have Adam and Eve. Exodus chapter 3, verse 21. We have Adam and Eve, and what did they do? They sinned. What does that mean? That means they broke the commandments. Give me one second. No, I want Genesis chapter 3. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Give me, give me Genesis chapter 3. I have multiple things happening in my mind. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. They sinned, and sin has to be paid for with what? Blood. God didn't just start that when Jesus came. He didn't just start that in the Exodus. He started that from the foundation of the world. Now, let's take a look. It says, and unto Adam says, unto unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. This is after they found out that they were naked. Where do you think he got those coats of skins from? They're from an animal. What kind of animal? A lamb. See, he had to kill a lamb in the garden to provide a covering for Adam and Eve. So the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. He's always been there to make an atonement for our sins. Give me one more verse. Let me see verse 22. I want you to see what changed in Adam and Eve. It says, and the Lord God said, behold, the man is become as one of us. What does that mean? Who's who's he talking to? First of all, (laughs) who's he talking to? This is. God and he's talking to the Holy Spirit and he's talking to Jesus and he says look Adam has become like one of us what does that mean let's keep reading to know good and evil because what did he know before he disobeyed God he only knew good he had no idea what it was 
to displease God. Now he knows things that are displeasing to God and he can make that choice whenever he wants. It says to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. God couldn't change the fact that the tree of life makes you live forever. So he said, I got to get you away from the tree of life so that you don't eat it and then live forever with the knowledge of evil. See that? See, you can't live forever if you have the knowledge of evil, because with the knowledge of evil comes the choice to do good. Remember, we, we talked recently and I was like, you guys don't really have a choice. I know we think that choice is our greatest power, but once you make that one choice, we made it. We're like, uh, as for eat, us in our house, we will. So we made this choice and then all the rest of our choices are made for us. Right? Yeah. Okay. Take me back. Revelation chapter 13. That's what verse 8 means when it says, written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. That was the foundation of the world. Okay? Give me verse 9. The Bible says, if any man have an ear, what is he supposed to use it for? <laughs> Let him hear. See, some of us is running around here, and we don't hear that good. We need hearing aids. Yeah, we need we need someone to aid us with our hearing. That's all that means. What, what does that mean? What does that mean? When someone wears a hearing aid, are they deaf? No, they can hear. It's just very dull. It's not a crystal clear sound. See, we need someone to help us hear better from the Lord. We need someone who can tell us, hey, I know you thought God said that, but that wasn't God. You need to learn to hear the voice of God a little bit better. Watch this. Give me Matthew chapter. I'm going to show you some precepts real quick. I want you to see where we're, where we're doing this at. Give me Matthew 13, 15. I want you to take a look at what it says. Matthew 13, 15. Okay, watch this. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are, what's that word? Dull. Are they sharp? They're hearing, but they can't make out none of the words. <laughs> their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes, they have closed. Lest at any time, any time? That means at any time, whenever they start listening to the voice of God and seeking him in the Bible, what it says, Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart. What does understand mean? It means to depart from evil. So what have they done? They saw, they heard, and they changed. Okay, now watch this. And then what happens? And should understand with their heart and should be converted. How did you get converted? How did you get converted? The law converted you. Hold that. We're going to hold that scripture. Give me Psalms chapter 19, verse 7. There is only one definition. There's only one thing in the Bible that says it's able to convert. It's this one thing only. Psalms chapter 19, verse 7. We're going to come right back here to this Matthew scripture, though, so that we can finish it up. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple okay now you take that now you have to take my word for it because you have maybe you have or have not read the entire bible but there is no other definition for the word converting this is the only thing that is going to convert you in the whole bible okay take me back to matthew 13 15 now he says for this people's heart is waxed gross that means grown fat and their ears are dull of hearing. That means they hear, but they're not making out the words. And their eyes, they have closed. That means they open it up. <laughs> like you open up the book and you're like, yeah, no, this is good right here. <laughs> Whoo, this is my favorite book. Your eyes is closed. What are you talking about? You're not trying to find the path, right? Now watch this. It says, and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted by the what? by the law and then what happens and I should heal them okay <clears throat> give me Acts chapter 28 verse 27 Acts chapter 28 verse 27 look what it says oh you got something Michelle
That's a very good question. She said, if someone is saved and they choose to not continue practicing, are they going to go to hell? So in order to answer your question, I have to answer you. I have to ask you a question back. How did they get saved? Jesus said, he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. So your question is saying, if they got saved, but then they didn't endure to the end, are they going to hell? What's the answer? Absolutely. If he explains that the prerequisite for going to the kingdom is endurance and you like, yeah, OK, I know Jesus. I got introduced. We're in a relationship now. But then you start cheating on him halfway through and you don't stay with him all the way to the very end. You're not going to be the bride when he comes back. Does that make sense? OK, now it's not so much that they're going to hell. They're going into the lake of fire. The hell in Hebrew is the word Sheol. It means a pit in the ground. So they're going to die and they're going to go into the earth. But later, that pit is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. And that's when the lake of fire becomes hell. All right, let's take a look here. Acts chapter 28, verse 27. This is going to sound familiar. It says, For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. That is almost word for word, almost word for word. You know why we say stuff over and over to our children? Because we mean that. <laughs> I meant that. I really need you to start looking at what I'm saying, hearing what I'm saying, depart from evil, understand the law, statutes, and commandments of God so that you can be converted. Then I'll heal you. <laughs> oh, you think you're just going to stroll in here and get healing without doing anything that God wants you to do? That don't happen. We clearly see because we come in here all the time. That doesn't happen. All right. Take me back. We got all of that off one verse. If any man have an ear, let him hear. I'm really praying. I pray for you guys all the time. And I pray that you have an ear to hear. I don't pray for any specific thing to happen. I pray for the Lord's will to be done and for you to have eyes to see it. Because when you don't have eyes to see what God is doing, you will try to go against it and you make your life more difficult. Your arms are not long enough to box with God, right? So I pray, Lord, okay, I'm praying for Liz. I pray that your will be done in her life and that she has eyes to see it and ears to hear what you're telling her. That's it. Pray for all of y'all all the time. It's pretty easy. I want you to pray for me the same thing. Revelation chapter 13, verse 10. Here we go. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. That's funny. That don't have nothing to do with the beast. This is weird. This must be a preset. Watch. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. That don't have nothing to do with the beast or the dragon or the image of the beast. This must be a preset. It must not be related to what we read before. Let me keep reading and find out. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Did that verse have anything to do with what we're talking about in this chapter? It didn't talk about the beast. It didn't talk about the Antichrist. Antichrist didn't lead nobody into captivity. He didn't kill nobody with the sword. This is how you know you have a precept. When you find something and it's an anomaly and you're like, man, that don't really go with what I'm reading. It feels like I changed the page. Now you got to search it out. Now you got to figure out what is he talking about? He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. What's that called? You did something to me and then the same thing happened to you? That's payback. <laughs> That's payback. You killed somebody with a sword and then you got killed with a sword? What is that called? Payback. When does payback start coming? See, we have this thing now called grace and all grace does is prevent payback. Grace is unmerited favor. It gives you the opportunity to repent before you get paid back because you did it. You're guilty. You're worthy of whatever happens to you, but you've got grace right now. But when Jesus comes back, there ain't no more grace. So what you did, you get paid back for. Give me Isaiah chapter 33, verse one. It took me a while to find this precept. Isaiah chapter 33 
verse 1. <clears throat> the Bible says, Woe to thee that spoilest, and thou wast not spoiled, and dealest treacherously, and they dealt not treacherously with thee. When thou shalt cease to spoil, thou shalt be spoiled. And when thou shalt make an end to deal treacherously, they shall deal treacherously with thee. That means payback is coming, right? I don't, don't think that it's always going to continue the way that it is now. When people talk about you behind your back, when they, they, they cheat you out of your position, they're dogging you out and doing all of that stuff. We just read a scripture that said, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. Their payback is coming, but it's not coming from you. Think about that. It's not, you don't get to do it. You get to see it, but you don't get to do it. Watch this. Give me 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. God is all about payback. But he's also all about mercy and grace. And you're like, wait a minute, how's that possible? You're about getting even? Of course. What does a judge love? Just balances. He loves it to be balanced out. Okay, but he's a righteous judge, but he's also full of mercy. But there is a time when his mercy ends. And then it's payback time. The Bible says, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Everybody that's troubled you, they're going to get paid back by God. And he says, that's righteous. Why is it righteous? Because I'm setting things in the proper balance. If your whole life you've been killing people with the sword, guess how you're going to die? Real quick, right? Okay. Take me back to the revelation. I want you guys to see something. This is how you know it's a precept. You're like, man, that doesn't that doesn't have nothing to do with what we're talking about. Look at this last sentence. It says, here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Patience, that means this is what you're waiting for. What are you waiting for? For God to pay back everybody who ever did you wrong. All those times when you just had to turn the other cheek and just let it go, you are patiently waiting for God to pay those people back. He's definitely going to do it. We just read the scripture. It says it's a righteous thing for him to do that. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Give me Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here, patience, saints. This is how you know it's a precept. Revelation 14, 12, what does it say? Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. What's that called? The law and the testimony. The commandments is the law. The faith of Jesus is the testimony. What do you think it's talking about? Oh, you got a question? What you got? Mm -hmm. So the captains, okay. That's a good question. Let me show you the answer. She asked, what about if you go to war and your captain tells you to do something, but it's not what God is telling you to do? What are you in? That's a conundrum. You're stuck between a rock and a hard place. But your obedience is always rewarded. God is tests people. Does that make sense? So maybe it's a test and he's saying, are you going to listen to me or listen to them? Give me Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17. The Bible says, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. If you are ever in a position where God has placed another person over you, that person is accountable to God for everything that they say to you. 
This is the reason why the Bible says don't be many teachers. You guys do not want this position up here because I am accountable for every single thing that I say to every single one of you. That's why I spend so much time praying and reading and you know what I'm not ready to give that message yet because I can't say that because I'm gonna go into the courtroom and I'm gonna stroll in like ha ah, where the book at and he's gonna be like um do you remember on uh, September 7th for and he, he's gonna be like you said this and that's not that was not my word and they did this because you said that so now I'm accountable for everything that I say to you does that make sense okay now, we could talk about that more later because it's not specifically related to what we're covering in Revelation. Take me back. Revelation chapter 13. We just covered verse 10. We found out that verse 10 is a precept. It's a scripture that we would say is out of place. It's not related. But what did we learn from it? That here, here where? What is he saying? He's seeing the kingdom. He says, here, what have I said? Here, right here, this is the patience of the saints. Here is where the people that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus are. He's talking about here, he's saying this is a specific place where the people do that. Give me verse 11. Man, time is flying. All right, now watch this. Now it's going to get personal. And I beheld another beast. Another beast? Where's this beast coming from? Coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon. What? Wait a minute. Hold on. How many beasts have we seen so far? We got uh, Babylon. Then we have Medo-Persia. Then we have Greece. Then we have Rome. Those are the four beasts. So he says, I saw another beast. Anybody want to take a guess? It's not the EU. That's a good guess, though. That's really good. Take a look down. You're standing in the belly of it. This other beast that rises up out of the earth, it's America. Okay, now watch this. No other beast in the entire Bible ever rose out of the earth. When we were reading earlier, where did these beasts rise up out of? Whether you read all of Daniel, all of Revelation, every single beast comes out of the sea. This beast comes up out of the earth. Let's look at this beast for a second because he has two horns. Like what? Like a lamb. He, he, what'd you say? What'd you say? Okay. No, it's not that. That's good thinking, no. Sometimes you guys got to start thinking out of the box. It says like a lamb. Who's the lamb? Jesus is the lamb. So this, this beast has two horns. And they're similar to how Jesus rules. But he speaks like a dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan is the dragon. This beast comes from the earth. The two horns represent peace. Isn't that what the Antichrist is going to use to conquer? He has a bow. And this is what's interesting. I didn't really realize this, but I just got a bow. <laughs> and the people who sent me my bow, they didn't send me no arrows. They got me looking like the Antichrist out here. Because, you know, when the Antichrist comes back, he got a bow. Watch this, though. He's got a bow. And you grab onto the bow. Because we did this. We was practicing. And you pull it back. And you let it go. And what am I throwing up? What does he use when he conquers? He pulls back the bow and he lets it go. He throws up peace. This is a universal sign for peace. That's how he conquers. See, this, this beast has two horns. The two horns are the two principles. Just like the lamb, but he ain't the lamb. Watch this. The two horns represent peace, freedom of religion, which people did not have in the last beast, which was Rome, and freedom of government. That means separate church and state. That's what America is founded on. The last beast, which was Rome, it wasn't founded on that, was it? It was all combined together. So now this guy is saying, oh, you can, you can worship however you want to worship. We're all about peace. You come on over here, it's going to be all good. This beast, the Bible said, and he spake as a dragon. What does that mean? How does Satan speak? He tells lies. 
let me man we could be here till next week if i told you all the lies that they that they have been telling you in this place like i remember they said when you get out of slavery you're gonna get 40 acres and a mule are you guys familiar with 40 acres and a mule every single black person who was enslaved was promised 40 acres of land and a mule to work that land when slavery was abolished where my mule at that's all i want to know it's supposed to be passed down like right okay you guys know about slavery like we literally built this country it was built on the back of slaves and what did they get they got so-called freedom they got the ability to vote I'm not voting for you. It's been lies. Every single thing is lies. Um, anybody in here have a social security card? Does it make you socially secure? You ever thought about what that number was? How about a birth certificate? Because I know you think that the birth certificate certifies the fact that you were born. That's not what it's for. It's a receipt because you are a commodity. You are a product. <sighs> right they've been lying since before you were born when they came over here the israelites were already here they was already wearing fringes and they said hey uh we found them <laughs> okay go back on the ship and get those blankets you know the ones that are covered in in uh chicken pox and smallpox and all those diseases that we brought from europe and they said hey let's make peace with the indians and they gave them those blankets and they died and they took their land. They've been lying since day one. Now, even today, watch this. It, it clearly says, and he spake as a dragon. Well, what does a dragon tell you? The law is done away with. The Sabbath is on Sunday. Oh, you want to marry him? But he's a man. But you know it. It's okay. You go ahead. Same sex marriage is okay. Abortion is okay. Think about all those lies that they tell. See, it's not like we're talking about Afghanistan. We're talking about the, the home of the free and the land of the brave. Wow, isn't that crazy? Because the home of the free was built on free labor. All right, I'm not, I'm not going to get super deep into it. I just want you to see that when it's talking about these two horns, those two horns are the two things that the beast was founded on. Give me, all right. Give me, uh, give me verse twelve. Man, I'm cutting it really close. This will be my. Oh come on. <laughs> okay, I'm so close. I'm so close, you guys. Look, watch this because this beast. Now that we know who it is, it's America. What does he do? He exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. Whose power is that? That's Rome. Rome. Okay, so now America starts to be an image of the beast that was before it. Where you guys think democracy came from? We don't believe in democracy, so I'm not going to get political, but they say there's a, a right and a left, right? The right wing and the left wing. Okay, those are both connected to the same body. I don't care how you look at it. If you're a Republican or you're a Democrat, you're the right or the left, you connected to the same body. We don't believe in democracy. We believe in the most high God. He didn't say everybody vote. And if enough of you vote, I'll change my laws. But isn't that what they say here? If enough of you vote against it, we'll change the law. Watch this. It says, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell thereon to worship the beast. America causes everyone in the world to worship the the beast that came before it. What beast is that? That's Rome. What is the largest religion in the whole world? Roman Catholicism. Whose deadly wound was healed. And you guys remember that? The Pope, they ran up in there and they said, we got to take you out. Boom, and then he died. But then they came back. Okay, before I get too crazy, watch this. In this same chapter, go to verse two. You guys with me? You good? I don't see nobody yawning tonight. We're getting really deep in here. Okay, so I'm going to go just a little bit more because you need to see this. Give me Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. Let's find out where the first beast got its power from. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, 
and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now we actually looked at the seat a couple weeks ago, didn't we? We can clearly see if you sit there, the dragon definitely got you sitting in that seat. Okay, watch this. It talked about the, the wound, the head that was wounded and then it was healed. Um, let me give you guys some dates real quick. The beast was wounded. It's Rome. It happened in 1798. The other beast is America. America was founded July 4th, 1776. 1776. So it was already in its infant stages when the first pope was cast out and put in exile. The beast was already born. It was already growing when the head was wounded and they thought it's just gone. They're like, it don't matter if it's gone because the other beast is already growing. Does that make sense? I'm trying not to get too super deep right now. Take me back to Revelation 13, 13. And he, that's the second beast, doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man. Okay, let's talk in the physical now. I'm, 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 I'm explaining these things, but I'm doing it both in the spiritual, the mental, and the physical. How did they physically make fire come down from heaven? They got some launch codes, and they said, see Japan over there? And what happened? Hiroshima. How is they? Naosaki. Okay, now watch this. They make fire come down from heaven in the sight of men. Wow, that is the greatest power that you can possibly imagine. It's so great that it's exactly what God says his two witnesses will be able to do. What are the two witnesses able to do? They're able to make fire come down from heaven whenever they want. And they can smite the earth with curses and they can turn the water to blood. Give me Genesis chapter 19 verse 24. So, because there is a fake Christ coming, there also has to be fake prophets coming. And they have to do the same thing that the real prophets are able to do. Look at this, Genesis 19.4. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, come past the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. Give me the next verse. No, no, it's, I want 9.24. I'm sorry, 19.24, give me... Give me Exodus 9. Okay. Give me Genesis. I'm going too fast because give me Genesis 19 verse 24. Now we have it. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Who did it? God did it. You guys remember, um, there's a story. Watch. Give me Exodus 9 24. Exodus chapter 9 verse 24. So the Lord rains fire from heaven. Now, of course, the Antichrist pretending to be Jesus has to do what God does so he makes fire come down so that people would believe him. Now watch, it says, so there was hell and fire mingled with the hell, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. It had never rained fire. Okay? Give me 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 10. This is the story of Elijah and the 450 false prophets. They say, cut up a bull and you put it on your altar. I'm going to take a bull and I'm going to put it on my altar. Now watch how this is related. It says, and Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50. Ah, no, this is a different story. I'm sorry. Different story. If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him. And his 50. So we see the men of God are able to make fire come down. We don't have time to get into that other story, but I want you to see it's the fire that comes down from heaven that Satan has never been able to do, that now that he's able to do it, he uses that to deceive the men on the earth. Take me back to Revelation. I'm going to close it up. Okay. He doeth. Uh, and he doth, 
He doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man. We're going to read verse 14, but I don't have the time to break it down. So we will pick it up at verse 14 next week. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. The specific one, the wound that had the, the, the head that had the wound by the sword and did live. What did he say that they should make? I want to show you guys just two pictures real quick because there is a mental, a physical, and a spiritual. What did they say they should make? An image to who? To the head that had the wound, but it did live. Go ahead and show them the first one real quick. I want to show you the image that they made. Who's that? Don't nobody say Jesus. That man's name is Cesare Borgia. Guess who he is? In 1490, Pope Alexander VI, whose real name is Rodrigo Borgia, had his own son, Cesare Borgia, a murderer who had an incestuous relationship with his own sister and who murdered his own brother, pose as the model for all popular images of Jesus Christ. You guys see how that works, right? Because what does he say that he is? He says he's the father. He's the Pope. So of course his son would need to be the image that everybody becomes familiar with. Give me one more picture real quick. Man. This is actually Cesare. And this is the false image of Jesus. He modeled for that picture. All historical pictures of Jesus are actually a man named Cesare Borgia, who was the son of the Pope. What does that make him? If you believe that the Pope is the father, then this is clearly the son. And they made an image. Now, take me back to Revelation really quick. I want you to see verse 14 again. I don't have time to break it down. I just want you to see how the beast made everybody worship the image. It says, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Amen. All right. As you can see next week, next Sunday evening, we are going to get super deep. I got to break down verse 14. And there's only 18 verses in here before we get to the mark of the beast. So it's going to be extremely deep. I suggest that you read it at home and meet us here next Sunday at 6 p.m. This is the message that I have for you.